Cem Özdemir, ist der Cem Özdemir is hoping to lead the Green Party back into government after 10 years in Germany's upcoming election. Thank you. You grew up in a small town in southern Germany. Your parents were Turkish immigrants and Muslims. Can you tell us how that Christmas tree we can see behind us arrived in your family living room? My parents put it there. They always found it natural to have it there as we were living in Germany. They didn't want me to feel left out at Christmas time. Plus, my mother had grown up in Istanbul with Armenian neighbors, Jewish neighbors, and Greek neighbors. And they would always visit each other on their respective religious holidays. So on Muslim holidays, the Christian and Jewish neighbors would pop by, and vice versa. My family was pretty familiar with Easter and Christmas. You used to call yourself an Anatolian Swabian or Southwestern German. What about today? By profession, I'm a politician, but I'm still a Swabian. I coined the term Anatolian Swabian after I was first elected to parliament in 1994. The media had difficulty describing the phenomenon. I was called German Turk, Euro Turk, and even Spätzle Turk after the noodle dish from Baden Württemberg, where I was born. <laughs> So before the media went through the whole menu, I thought it best to come up with my own term. The first words I heard in the delivery room were the Swabian dialect, although my memory of that has faded a bit. And Anatolian actually stands for all the people who used to live in Turkey and still do. Jews, Christians, Muslims, Turks, Kurds. I didn't want to be reduced to one ethnicity or faith. I wanted to speak for everyone, including people from other backgrounds. But there was a moment in elementary school where you felt you were different. In terms of school grades, definitely. Up until fourth grade, I always got a five, one of the lowest grades. They wanted me to repeat first grade. It was standard practice in West Germany back then for pupils to go to secondary school after fourth grade. I remember sitting in the back row with the only other child with immigrant parents, a Portuguese boy. And the teacher asked what kind of school we'd like to go to after fourth grade, a regular secondary school or grammar school. My mother always wanted me to go to grammar school, as if you could snap your fingers and make it happen. When the teacher asked who wanted to go to a regular school, I didn't respond. But when he said grammar school, I put my hand up. He didn't see me at first because I was at the back. When he did, he burst into laughter, and the whole class laughed because the notion was so funny on account of my background. How did you feel? I didn't find it so funny. There are certain things you never forget. When one day I'm on my deathbed, I think I'll still remember them laughing. Did that trigger something in you, having to be better than the rest in order to succeed? It's the same situation that women face. It certainly fueled my ambition. It's about showing people that you can do or be something they think is beyond you. In my case, member of parliament, then party chairman, and now chancellor candidate for the election. You decided to take German citizenship in your teens. Today, you're in favor of a dual nationality law. I myself am happy with just one passport. It's hard enough to keep track of one passport. So should people have to choose one or the other? I was born here. I found it absurd not having the nationality of the country you're born in. Now you have a right to nationality by birth, which ironically was introduced by a government I was part of. So people like me, or at least our children, are now German by birth. And that's a good thing for all the shortcomings. There's nothing sacred for me about dual nationality. It's a polarizing issue in Germany. Some see it as a gift to humanity, others as a diabolical notion. I say the objective is naturalization. It's better for people who are permanent residents to be German citizens, because the country's problems are better discussed between citizens. I see dual nationality as a means to an end. 
ist dabei ein Mittel zum Zweck. Aber natürlich kann man mit mir darüber diskutieren. But of course, we can talk about whether it's sensible for someone who's been here for 30 or 40 years, maybe third generation, to be voting in the Turkish referendum. Shouldn't they be voting in German elections? Why is it that some people of Turkish or Arab origin don't identify with the country they've been living in for so long? Whose fault is that? There's nothing unusual about identifying with your ancestors' country. A lot of Germans do, too. But consciously turning down German citizenship? Germans living abroad also have a connection to Germany. They watch DW to see what's happening back home. That's perfectly okay. As is still speaking your native language, in addition to the local language. And they can practice their religion if they have one. But this is where any issues your children are facing are to be resolved, not by Mr. Erdogan or whoever else. In more concrete terms? Whose fault is it? In my opinion, the citizenship legislation should have come earlier. It took too long for us to admit that we are a country of immigration. Of course, there are consequences, but we can't be naive. There are other countries that also consciously don't want their citizens here to integrate, like Turkey. It applies to Mr. Putin, too, who wants German Russians here to point their antenna towards Moscow. Talking of Turkey, human rights activist Peter Steutner has just been arrested there. You posted this on Twitter. The German government's policy on Turkey is a shambles. What would you do differently if you were in power? Hindsight is always 2020. But for me, it was a big mistake for Chancellor Merkel to continue the same policy on Turkey as the preceding Social Democrat Green government. The EU was negotiating Turkey's accession. But that was a very different Turkey, a forward-looking Turkey that gave Christians more rights and discussed the Kurdish question. And even the awkward question of Armenia was the subject of relatively relaxed debate in the Turkish parliament. Women's rights were advanced. It was at a time when Turkey was on the right path when Merkel was pressured by her own party into saying a privileged partnership instead of membership. Is she to blame for the state that Turkey is in now? That would be simplifying matters. But she did play a part in pro-reform forces being denied support in Turkey. That was a major mistake. She only rediscovered Turkey when she needed the country during the refugee crisis. Then she flew over almost every other day, which made Erdogan think, the Germans and Merkel need me. I am a world leader. They will all come to me. That was a big mistake. We should have made it clear to Erdogan from the outset that he now has all areas of Turkish society firmly under his control is bad enough. The long arm of Erdogan has no business here. Remember when it emerged that Turkish mosques were being used for spying purposes and outing opposition activists? What happened? Nothing. The German government waited until all the evidence had been destroyed. That wouldn't have happened on my watch. If you were in a position to make those decisions, what would you do differently on the partnership with Turkey? I'd leave the accession talks where they are, on ice, right at the back of the freezer. And if Turkey does introduce the death sentence, as it is announced, then they'll stop completely. Then they'll break off completely. And Turkey will have to leave the Council of Europe. Then there's Turkey's barring our lawmakers from the NATO mission at Konya Air Base. German parliamentarians have the right to visit their army wherever they are stationed. If Erdogan doesn't relent, there will be a response from NATO in Brussels. It's a NATO mission. I think it's wrong of the NATO Secretary General to behave as if the problem is about Merkel versus Erdogan. The problem is Erdogan. Erdogan isn't acting in line with NATO. Erdogan is behaving like a ruffian in a bar who wants to beat everyone up. NATO has rules. NATO has shared values. If Erdogan has an issue with those values, then he should say so. And NATO will have to end the Konya mission. Would that mean rethinking our NATO partnership with Turkey? 
The response has to be by NATO, not us on our own. But the Secretary General is shirking his responsibilities. We in Germany have to say clearly that we will not tolerate Erdogan trying to get Turkish community organizations under his control via the front organizations he's invested so much money in here. Right now, as we speak, committees are being changed in one mosque after another in Germany, and the people in favor of integration pushed out. The people who can speak German, who talk to their Christian pastors, their Jewish rabbis and their German neighbors. They're being replaced by people who take their orders from Ankara. We should make a clear statement about this. I think Frau Merkel is too soft in this respect. We're now hearing the same condemnations with Peter Stoitner as we did with Turkish-German journalist Dennis Utel, who was arrested more than a hundred days ago and is still in detention. It seems there's a lot of talk, but not much action on the ground, including from yourself. We can't send troops to Turkey to liberate them. How about a demonstration? The Greens taking to the streets and saying, no way. We don't want to become a member of Turkey. Turkey wants to become a member of the EU. But what action can be taken? The Turkish economy is in serious trouble and is deeply unsettled by Erdogan's isolationist policy. German tourist numbers have dropped. Turkey is begging for economic aid from Germany. So I would say, I fail to see how Turkey qualifies for aid. I would tell German companies that Turkey is not a dependable location for investment. There's no rule of law. Anyone can be arrested arbitrarily. We would turn the thumbscrews so that Erdogan feels them. Util is in jail. Steutner is in police custody. Isn't it now time to say, instead of putting the EU accession talks on the back shelf, we need to break them off? I fear we will be seeing that all too soon. But one mistake we have to avoid is overlooking the 50% plus of people in Turkey who are against Erdogan, as seen in the referendum. If it had been fair, he would have lost. Erdogan wouldn't win a fair election anymore. He'd lose it. He lost the penultimate parliamentary election, which was arguably the last semi-fair one. That taught him to prevent elections being freely held. Opponents who he can't defeat are locked away, such as the HDP's Salatin Demirtas. They are denied access to the media. Imagine an election here in Germany under those conditions. Frau Merkel on all stations 24-7 with five minutes for the rest. Özdemir's in jail, and Martin Schulz gets beaten up. That's what's happening in Turkey. So what concrete steps would you suggest? Let's be honest. Our potential influence in Turkey is now limited. We did have options during the EU accession talks, and I think Frau Merkel made a mistake by relinquishing that instrument. There are rewards for reforms, and for the opposite, potentially sanctions. But Merkel punished Erdogan when he did something right and rewarded him when he did something wrong. But it's too late to change that now. The G20 summit. Looking forwards, it's bad enough that we're doing little or nothing on Turkey. But now Erdogan wants to establish Turkey in Germany. And I have to say quite clearly, that is not right. And I can prevent it. How? I'd say mosques here shouldn't get any more money from Turkey in future. And consequently, Germany has to make the commitment and offer Turkish communities here financial assistance to cut the umbilical cord. For instance, I can say that I reject any attempt to set up a parallel state here. A lot of opposition activists come to me and say, I'm not safe in Germany. Look at the attempt to infiltrate the security services. I think we should make it crystal clear that we won't stand for that here. In this respect, Germany is a bit naive. That sounds like a hard line. To explain things for our international audience, if you are to be in the next government, it would be as a junior coalition partner. I fear so. <laughs> That's the way it looks. Traditionally, the junior coalition partner takes the post of foreign minister, and that post would surely have its appeal for you. Let me put that out there. 
Our Swabian modesty says, first we have to win an election, and then, once you've conducted successful negotiations, you look at who will get which post. And of course, it's the people who led the party into the election who have a big say in matters, or indeed the final say. But first we have to win the election. Okay. But we'd still like to talk about a few of your other positions for the benefit of our international audience. Venezuela is a big story right now. We cover it daily here on DW. Do you feel that the German government should be more involved in this conflict? Maduro is guilty of awful human rights abuses. He ignores Parliament's decisions, and the people are paying for it. This is not a poor country. It's one of the richest countries in the world. But instead of investing in infrastructure and modernizing the oil industry, Hugo Chavez bought elections with gifts. What I find most appalling is that our own left party still justifies Chavez with their left-wing romanticism. When I was younger, I was interested in the opposition in El Salvador. I was for the Sandinistas, but I was 15. There can be no excuses for supporting this kind of coup from above from a president who legitimizes his power through force and who is wrecking the country. I want to see clear criticism here, and typically I'm hearing very little on the issue from my left-wing friends in other South American countries. What would you say? We, we have to move on. What would you say on the issue of Russia? It's similar. There are a lot of people whose criticism of human rights issues is defined by whether or not it's the Americans at fault. You have to be against human rights violations regardless of who commits them, whether the culprits have American support or a link to Russia. The same applies to Venezuela. And there are some on the left who define their version of human rights by saying, when supposed left-wingers lock people away and murder them, it's not as bad as when the gringos are doing it. That has nothing to do with my party's stance. We don't have any pet dictators. When Putin occupies part of Ukraine, he should be sharply criticized. And here I support Merkel. She was right to get Europe to impose sanctions on Russia. Should there be more sanctions? If Russia moves in the right direction, it should be rewarded. If Russia makes the wrong move, there must be different consequences. And currently? Russia has admitted to Russian troops having occupied the Crimea. We're currently seeing an escalation in the eastern Ukraine. That's why I see no reason to lift sanctions. On the contrary, I think the sanctions should be tightened. Russia is now hinting at the presence of Russian troops there too. There are reports of forced labor. I see no reason to reward Russia for that. Returning to Germany, what I wanted to know while preparing for the interview was what the Greens and yourself are fighting for today. The same things I joined the party for. That was November 1981, when I was 15. Back then, we were the only party addressing the environment and sustainability. And we've achieved a lot. Germany is the only country to commit to phasing out nuclear power. We convinced the mainstream parties to join our effort. But the CO2 emissions have not fallen in the last eight years. Germany is the world's biggest producer of lignite. There's still a lot of work to do. Frau Merkel signed the Paris Climate Accord, and for me that means the Greens are also committed to it. So I feel it is our duty to make Germany the world's leader in climate protection. How do you explain your party's falling poll ratings? Is it because of your candidacy? The Greens aren't in such a good position. In fact, they're now going up. We had dropped to 6%, and now it's up to 8 In the 2013 election, the Greens posted 8.4%. The last survey had you at 
bei 8 Prozent. Genau, und eine sieht uns sogar bei 9 Prozent. One has us at 9 Prozent. And in my native Baden-Württemberg, we're at 14 Prozent, up from 11 Prozent. Are you happy with those numbers? Nein. No. The job description of a party chairman from Swabia is to never be satisfied and always push for more. But I'd rather have the poor ratings at the start and then improve. In the 2013 general election, we had great opinion poll ratings, but ended up with 8.4 percent. Now it's the other way around. So you're satisfied? As I just said, I'm never satisfied. I always want more, and we're improving right now. And why is that? Apart from being here on DW, I'm attending a lot of campaign events. I was recently in a beer tent with 700 people in Bavaria. As you've tweeted, but what are you doing to get the message across in general? By touring the country. The election won't be decided in downtown Berlin. It will be decided in all the local newspapers and radio stations, just like in other democracies. There's a kind of bubble in downtown Berlin that applies both to us politicians and journalists. I'm where the election is decided, elsewhere in Germany. Is the environment issue enough? No, the big issue is also Europe. President Macron of France has offered to set up a climate union with Germany to make progress on carbon pricing. In my opinion, this is a unique opportunity to make Europe stronger together with Macron. I'd say yes. And I'm sure the Chancellor agrees. Except she doesn't dare make the move because of the right wing in her party. We would be resolute. And then there's the integration issue. I want a country where you're not judged by where you're from, but where you're headed. Regardless of whether people have Russian, Turkish or Swabian roots, everyone should be part of this new us. And I'm committed to that. You frequently criticize Frau Merkel. What would she have to do to get your vote? She has done some things right. I always try to be fair. I praised her earlier for the sanctions on Russia and keeping Europe together. And we supported that. Where I see the major deficit is the environment. When it comes to the headlines, she's world class. When I see Trump or the Brexit vote, she's a glowing figure. But once you scratch beneath the surface, Germany is not a leader on climate protection. CO2 emissions have not fallen in eight years. So when we go to the G20 summit wanting to get progress from Trump but come back empty-handed, then it was for nothing. Germany can do better. We have a great medium-sized sector and research infrastructure. We have a lot of startups making good money from environmental innovations. We need a government that rediscovers its faith in Germany's strength as a business location, and that environmental and economic interests are one and the same. And that's what my party stands for. Herr Estemir, a while ago you did a photo shoot for Gala magazine with classic German motifs. You can see it in the photo behind us. What in your eyes is still German today? The photo shoot had all these stereotypes. The crossword, the bathrobe. You can't see the white socks. For me, Germany is firstly a country that enjoys great respect in the world, even if the Made in Germany brand has now gotten a few scratches. Also Berlin's ongoing new airport saga. Or close to home for you, Stuttgart? The railway station there is an embarrassing issue. The diesel emission scandal too. I'm annoyed about the impact in health terms. But also because so many consumers bought a car in good faith, only to find what was promised was a lie. Germany, three sentences. What is German? Germany is a fantastic country with a strong democracy. We did a great job with the refugees, which many other countries are envious of. Sure, there are problems, but we have everything we need to solve them. Do you have a typical German quality? Look at Bad Ura, where I was born. Mainly Protestant, but the neighboring town is Catholic. And right there you have different traits. There's no such thing as the Germans or the Turks. There is no uniform Protestant or Catholic or Muslim. We're all different, which is great. Three concrete adjectives. 
Jetzt sind wir natürlich dann bei den Klischees. Then we're back to stereotypes. German workmanship, German engineering, diligence and order. If I'm talking to my friends of Turkish origin, I say, don't combine Turkish efficiency with German hospitality. It should be the other way around. One final question. Imagine having to spend a month on a desert island and you have to take someone along in order to survive. You have to pick. One of your rivals for Chancellor. Did I hear that right? I have to pick one? One of them? Not Zara Wagenknecht or Frau Merkel. I'm happily married. I take Martin Schulz because he used to be a librarian and have a bookstore. So he could talk about all the great books I've never had time to read. I hope he would tell me a lot about them. The Social Democrats Martin Schulz with Cem Özdemir on a desert island. And I'll report when we get back. Thank you very much for talking to us. <laughs>